Now, did the, the buyer and the seller have to be represented on each side by an attorney, or how does that? I mean, no. And I mean, in technicality, you don't need an attorney. You could just walk into the company clerk's office and sign a deed over to whoever it is you want to do it. Um, generally speaking, and because I'm high volume, I always have the seller here represented by an attorney. God forbid if there's any issues, this or that, there's some separation here. Um, my attorney is not exposed to both sides and we both have representation. Hey guys, welcome back to the Probate House Guy podcast. I am Brad Woodall, the Probate House Guy. And today I have my buddy Phil Grenier from Buffalo, New York. Phil and I have known each other for a little over four years now, met through a real estate mastermind we're in. And small world, uh, a f- local friend of mine that I do deals with is a, happened to be a friend of yours from high school, which is pretty wild, and we live uh, pretty far away from each other. So, Phil, welcome to the show today. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Tell us about your background, kind of where you came from, what you're doing today. Um, yeah, so, I, that same friend that you mentioned, Chad, got me introduced to the property preservation and more support servicing industry. 2006, 2007, um, I started off as a grunt. I was moving garbage and doing maintenance for the banks. Uh, ended up running my own company and another uh, local competitor's company for a few years. Also sold foreclosed homes. Did a ton of culture or a million in bank valuations. Um, I got an institutional entrance into the industry, I guess. Um, Past five years, been independent investing. Um, our company does a little bit of everything: flips, rentals, wholesale deals. But give or take, 100, 120 transactions a year. That's a pretty significant amount of volume, there, my friend. That's a lot more than I do typically in a year. But that's you're in a, you're in a little bit of a different market there. Buffalo um, has some uniqueness to it. Uh, obviously, this time of year, you're shoveling snow all the time. But what are their kind of what other kind of things are unique about the Buffalo market right now? I mean, if you believe Zillow, uh, we're one of the up and coming markets here. We're top 10 for 2024. Um, it's seen a census growth for the first time in 30 years locally. So, I mean, definitely trending in the right direction. Um, gentrification's in a couple of markets. I mean, the, we're, we're growing. That's awesome. Do you do you do deals all over sort of greater Buffalo area? Like what kind of what areas do you cover? Um, so primarily I cover two counties, Erie and Niagara, or the Buffalo and Niagara Falls markets, all the suburbs around there. Um, we do wander into the southern tier as well, Chautauqua and Cat. Um, just not really as prevalent down there. So uh, over the year, you've been doing this now for five years. How has your kind of deal focus and mix changed or has it changed over the years? Like uh, obviously this business ebbs and flows and we go through these different cycles. What What's that been like in Buffalo? Um, So, I mean, New York State is not landlord friendly. So, I mean, back in the COVID days, buying unoccup- or occupied on cooperative tenants became very difficult. And I've got a war story. It took me two years to complete an eviction right in BlackRock. Uh, former landlords, ERAP money got approved right after we bought it. So my eviction was thrown out nine months later. Um, I mean, moral of the story was it was two years, no collected grants. And actually, the house is still pending to this day. But there's nothing you can do about it. Um I guess as my business has grown, I think it's just the evolution of a real estate investor. It's gone from more of a wholesale focus to a fixing flip and a holding focus. Um, I mean, I joke, I'm a drug dealer to your local real estate investor. These guys don't like me because I'm cute. They like me because of the product that we're selling. Everybody needs deals. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if, especially if you're wholesaling deals, like if you want to do this long term you've got to like provide deals you know i get some of these quote unquote deals in my inbox and they're awful deals i'm sure maybe some people are buying these things but 
in the last year, at least here and where I live in Atlanta, since the market's kind of shifted, it's like some of the stuff is like, no one's paying, like none, the hedge funds aren't even paying that anymore, you know? It's like all these guys got used to the the gravy train from selling deals to hedge funds and then paying like crazy top dollar for them. Now all of a sudden they're not buying anymore and they're like, well, I can't move my deals. It's like, because it's not a deal, dude. <laughs> That's why. Yeah. Dude, I get it. We have a couple of competitors in our market that are good, but for the most part, it's, it's not a deal to begin with. It's a newbie trying to sell junk and good luck to be overpaid for it to begin with. They're just not confident at what they're doing. What what would you say, I mean, obviously, here in Atlanta where I live, there's a lot of a lot of newbie wholesalers, right? And there's a lot of those jokers, but there's, you know, probably not that many major operators, I would say. We kind of all know each other. Is, is Buffalo kind of the same kind of the same thing? Yeah, same thing. I mean, it's just like Buffalo Festival. There's fuckity flicks of, you know, your jacks, your gots here etc etc but i mean the real estate industry is just a small world here locally i mean if i was a newbie i'd go to the biggest guy in the market and try to work for him i mean i need some experience and how to operate a deal and get familiar with with how it works gone and blind you can cause yourself a lot of pain definitely so let's talk about getting deals um i know you're doing some um you're doing some tv stuff in your market and some radio stuff tell me about like what is your marketing mix and how has your marketing mix kind of evolved over the years and in, in getting your deals because you got to get the deals to sell them right yeah i mean so marketing wise um i mean I just, when i started i was broke hell in my opinion i'm still broke um uh, but it, it it was all outbound to begin with. Text messaging, both calling, a lot of volume, a lot of sifting, and a lot of labor. Um, we still do that on a minimal scale, but primarily we've changed to in- inbound. I mean, as I'm sure you know, it's a data science. Even before the marketing, making sure that you're getting prime data and you're pulling valid information currently in your market is the biggest thing. This great. Uh, at the moment, I guess our leading channels are a mix between mail, television, pay-per-click. Um, it's kind of been what's working for us the best. At a certain point, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it just becomes a branding equation. When you're on television, when you're in the mail, when you're on the radio, it becomes a little harder to decipher on exactly what's working. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, because so many people say, oh, my ads don't work or whatever, but then they're not looking at their website and the traffic's coming in on their website because it does become a branding play at that point. And it's hard to quantify where the traffic's coming from. So like when you're doing all those, you kind of have to look at it as a whole uh, because, you know, you just can't always pinpoint it, especially, you know, people will be Googling your name and then and then looking you up later and maybe they're not responding now. So yeah, that's a good point there. So, um, obviously having known you, uh, for a number of years, um, tell me about your transition and your struggle, uh, from being a solo operator to now you have a team of people. Um, you know, your team comes to the mastermind groups. Um, I've had to become a team operator over the years. Tell me how you've evolved as an investor from being a solo guy to the team guy. Yeah. I mean, You'll definitely encourage this, but I mean, at a certain point, it's just too much for one individual. I'm a workaholic, and if I live by that, I'll be the first one to say it. Good luck out working me, but it's just, it's not healthy and it's not scalable. Um, Michelle, my assistant, was the first tire I'd made. If somebody's looking for staff, I would definitely start with the executive assistant, number two, whatever you want to call it. But I mean, you got to start to get rid of a bunch of the uh, clerical nonsense in the background and focus on revenue generating activities. Um, I mean, in the past couple of years, we've grown from just me working out of my mother's basement um, to a team of 12. 12 people. Wow. And what does your team kind of look like? Like what, what are the different roles that you've got going on there? Um, so we've got 
acquisitions, dispositions, operations, marketing, um, lead management, construction staff, um, executive assistant. We're, we're pretty built out at this point in time. Um, and we're continuing to add people. Unfortunately, people suck and nobody wants to work. So finding quality talent is always a struggle. Absolutely. And, and, and I've learned a lot over the years about kind of hiring people and recruiting people and, and hiring the right people. And that's, that's a, an ongoing struggle for sure, especially also depending on the position that you're hiring for. Sometimes you're just pool of candidates, especially in the construction world is, you know, kind of hit or miss. Right. Um, so you got to like understand who you're hiring, what they're going to be doing. What does that person's, you know, personality profile look like? You know, there's a lot of factors that go into play on that for sure. Um, I use PI on all my major hires for the most part. Do you? Lay a belly bolt to all the look at. Yeah. Yeah. PI is important. What? It's not cheap, but uh, it's definitely a powerful tool to to use to to hire people. We, you know, we've used it, also used kind of disc profiles and, and all that sort of stuff, hiring people over the years. And you got to hire that right person. And sometimes you'll lose the right person, too. I remember a few years ago, I had an, I had an admin assistant, and she was awesome. And she just got a better job offer from another position that really was much, you know, better for her. Um, and I was sad to see her go, but I, I hired someone else and she's been great too. I kind of followed those same principles that I used to hire my first admin assistant, followed those same steps, that process. And I hired a great one the second go around too. It just requires a little bit of thought to go into that. So um, in Buffalo, um, you're in New York, which you mentioned is not a landlord friendly state. Um, obviously, this is the probate house guy podcast. So let's talk about probate stuff a little bit. I know you do some deals. I, I know you don't necessarily market directly to them, but just by default, you get into them by all the different marketing channels you have. What is that? How long does that process typically take in Buffalo? And do you have any kind of crazy stories or anything along that, that route? I mean, it's, a, a, I guess, a twofold question. It depends on the seller or the client themselves. Are they an organized individual? Do they have wills filed? Were they proactive before, unfortunately, somebody passed away? Or do they have nothing? I mean, if you're starting at square one and have to chase down cousin Tony, cousin Sally, and get everybody's written approval to sell the estate, I mean, unfortunately, in my opinion, you could be talking a couple of years. Um, New York State is unbelievable. Um, Erie County, I guess, even more specifically, the surrogates courts are still complaining about COVID, uh, saying that they're backed up because of that. I mean, at a certain point, it is no longer a valid excuse. It's fucking 2024. Let's move on, people. Um, I guess on the other side of the coin, with a couple of years mentioned, in reality, if your I's are dotted and T's are crossed, you're talking nine months is realistic still has to get published and all that wonder wonderful other stuff that i can't give you legal advice on now do you have uh like an attorney or a handful of attorneys that you kind of work with on a regular basis to kind of help you get these deals to the finish line in your area absolutely um having so i mean my attorney will never do both sides of a transaction so we have a great attorney referral network where we can put the seller in confident hands to make sure that this transaction is going to go from cradle to grave. Um, for the most part, we try to encourage them to take one of three options. When we meet with the seller, hey, I know we just met. You need to get an attorney to verify everything that I'm saying is true um, and to walk you through the probate process. I don't like giving them one option because it's kind of steering in my opinion, but hey, go to Google, look these people up. Here are three attorneys in our area that we know will get this done. And yeah, and speaking of attorneys in New York, from a closing perspective, you guys are an attorney state, which is a little different. Like we have closing attorneys in Georgia, but the, 
in essence, they're basically a title company. Um, it's just the attorney is required to be the one doing the closing. Tell me about that closing process in New York and how that gets a little crazy and wild up there. I mean, so the attorneys aren't dumb. They essentially wrote themselves into the local board of realtors contract with some job security. So that's the biggest reason that they're pretty earth. And, and we just don't have title companies. I mean, for the most part, and I can't say that I've ever done a transaction in the title state, it's the same thing, except instead of going to the title agency, you're going to the attorney. Specifically, what I look for on an attorney, and Sam, my existing attorney has this, is that they have title in house. I don't want to be dealing with an attorney that can't can't run their own title and can't do their own searches. Um, At the end of the day, speed is one of the services that we're selling and is most important to the client. And when titles get outsourced to a third party, it just becomes a nightmare. What is a tip and and up where you're at? How long does it typically take to get from you know contract to close on a deal? What's that typical timeline? We're all running at like thirty four days okay. right now. It's not terrible. There's always a chance to that role, but yeah, third give or take thirty days. Nice, yeah. If you've got a good title company, I mean, I've been able to close deals in less than a week before here in Georgia with a good title company. Um, where I say good. It's What's possible. It? Is it? It's okay. possible. Yeah. I've heard some horror stories in New York of deals taking forever. And maybe that's our buddy Pinter out uh, on the uh, east side of New York there that deals with a lot of that craziness. But, uh, yeah. And the whole state's shot. But I think that cesspool downstate is even a little worse. I mean, he's told me stories about back and forth of, you know, there's just, they're like red... It reminds me of my days back in uh, corporate America when we would try to like roll out this new software program and the attorneys on each side would sit there and redline contracts back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It took like three months to get a contract signed on things. It was it was like insanity. Um, That's I I would go nuts. I am a man of action. Just get out of the way. Tell me what I then. Now, did the the buyer and the seller have to be represented on each side by an attorney, or how does that? I mean, no. And I mean, in technicality, you don't need an attorney. You could just walk into the company clerk's office and sign the deed over to whoever it is you want to do it. Um, generally speaking, and because I'm high volume, I always have the seller be represented by an attorney. God forbid. If there's any issues, this or that, there's some separation here. Um, my attorney is not exposed to both sides, and we both have representation. I think it okay. just provides a transparency to the seller as well. Um, hey, we just met. You have an opportunity for attorney review to take this contract and verify everything that I said is, in fact, true. This is a good thing. Well, it's good you're still getting them done pretty quickly, and it like I mentioned in Georgia, we we use attorneys here, but really there's the attorney's kind of a neutral third party here in Georgia. Technically, the attorney represents the lender in transactions. Um, they don't represent either the buyer or the seller. They're really just a, basically a title agent um, here, uh, but they have to, you know, the state laws say that an attorney has to be the one who closes the transactions. State laws, you know, who wrote those state laws? Right, attorneys. Yeah. And all the legislature, and most of them used to be attorneys too. That's right. So um, in New York, in regards to probate deals, do you have any crazy probate deals or just in general? I know you're talking about dealing with some junk on one deal. Like what? what's that like in your market? Yeah, I mean, we're finishing out a uh, slip in Cheek Duwaga suburb right around here. I mean, we got two boats, uh, 1973 Ford on blocks. I mean, I think the house was like 1,100 square feet, and we pulled like 70 yards of garbage out of it. So, I mean, in some circumstances, I mean, when you're dealing with an estate, it's just overwhelming of the amount of junk for all intents and purposes that was left behind. You need that newspaper article from 1943. You never know when you're going to use that. That's right. Yeah, we. I would say 
nine out of every 10 deals that we buy, we're cleaning something out. Um, some little bit of junk. I'm closing on one tomorrow and it's going to be probably one of the cleanest houses I've bought in a long time. I mean, my junk removal guys probably got one load of stuff to get rid of, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually excited because I've got my painters lined up to start on, on, we're closing on it tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow's Wednesday, uh, we're recording this and my, my junk removals guys come as Thursday and then my painters starting either Thursday afternoon or Friday morning to get started painting the house. Like I'm so excited. I've never had one go that fast before. Yeah. They're few and far between when somebody's, you know, not on the floor or on the way out the door. Generally it's here's the keys. It's your problem. Well, I don't want to deal with this. Yeah. And that's, that's the service that you're selling to when you're, when you're doing this sort of thing is this people, especially in probate and inheritance, a lot of the kids and the heirs, like they don't, they don't want all of mom's stuff. Like they want, maybe they want these few things, but like everything else to them is just junk. They don't, they don't want it. Um, and, uh, or even if they are local, yeah. Or extremely grandma's dining room table is just not the antique that she thought it was. Yep. It's a, it, a lot of value to her. It, it's crazy when, you know, when, when my parents die one day, my mom's an interior designer by profession she's done that her whole career and she's got like a basement just full of all this furniture and i'm like mom i don't want any of that furniture <laughs> like i have a house full of furniture i don't need any of your stuff you know so you could just give it away or do whatever you know make somebody else happy right now but you know i don't have to clean out this basement full of furniture so this was back in the foreclosure days but we tried to drop the stuff off at habitat for humanity and, and other donation places and they told us just to go away because i mean we were pulling up with a 40-foot box truck loaded we got everything the kitchen sink the couch but they didn't even want it. yeah yeah i've donated some stuff but most of the time at least i feel like it's faster just to trash it out it's funny my my acquisitions guy is an older guy and he is like just by nature, he's a wheeler dealer kind of person. He's like, oh, we could sell this for that and that. And I'm like, no, <laughs> we get rid of yeah. it all. If you want to do something with it, you can get it. You you have, uh, and I've, t I've had him do this before. Like you have till tomorrow to get it out of the house. If you want to go sell it on your own on whatever Facebook, you are more than welcome to, but I want it out of the house by tomorrow. If you want to go on your own dime, put it in a storage unit or whatever, and you sell it, that's fine with me, but I need it out of the house because I got to get this house turned, you know? And uh, I get it uh, all the time. I don't I don't care what you do with it, but it's got to be gone today because we are not painting around the sun. Yeah, otherwise the whole, I remember we did, the first time he did that, We there was this big, massive, like, hutch in this dining room of this house. Gorgeous piece of furniture, huge. Thing probably weighed like 80 bazillion pounds. He's like, oh, this thing's worth so much money. I was like, no, it's not. No one's going to buy that. And we sat there and sat there and sat there. And I had wholesaled the deal to one of uh, one of my buyers that's actually, we do partnerships on deals. She loans me money. Like sometimes I wholesale her. It just depends on the deal. And she's like, I need this thing like gone. And he dropped the price, dropped the price, tried to give it away for free. Couldn't even give it away for free. And finally, we sent a guy over with a chainsaw and just cut it up into pieces and threw it away. So, yep. No, I get it. It just oh. wouldn't do. It. So, well, hey, man, I appreciate you coming on today and talking a little bit about Buffalo. And um, so, your uh, company is Buffalo Brick and Mortar, um, and you are doing deals all over the place and doing a lot of marketing. So, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, Phil, what's the best way that they could reach you? Uh, they can check us out on the web, Buffalo Brick and Mortar dot com. Or uh, give us a call on Ian Diamond. Awesome. And do you do any help with like newer investors, kind of helping them, you know, get structured deals and that sort of stuff? I mean, we all started at some point, right? Yeah, no, I mean, and we work with a couple wholesalers here that have gotten themselves jammed up. I'm fairly active in one of two areas in our backyard. So if anybody comes to the local events, there's a good chance to can catch me there. Uh, I mean, education is the best way to grow a business relationship. So I'm here to teach. Awesome. Well, hey, Phil, thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. 
And uh, if anyone wants to get a hold of you, uh, they can obviously find you at the RIAs. They can find you at Buffalo Brick and Mortar, any social media or something that they could get a hold yeah, of you. Facebook, Instagram, Google, shoot me an email, uh, whatever you need. Cool. All right, guys. Well, today that concludes our episode of the Probate House Guy podcast. Um, by the way, guys, I have a very unique way of getting probate and inheritance deals. It's a little bit different than what most people are used to. Um, and I'm actually generating leads and deals all over the country. So if you're interested in one of being our partners, uh, for example, Phil is one of our partners in the Buffalo market, um, reach out to us at probatehouseguy.com and you can learn a little bit more. So thanks for checking out this episode today. Stay tuned for the next one. All right, guys, talk to you later.